Hello. Hmm. Wow. Hmm. Good to be back. Mm, wonderful to see everybody. Mm. Is Quinn here yet? Let's see. I just want to thank her. Can't see. Ah, there, there you are. she is. Hi, Hi Quinn. Hi, Quinn. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Mm, okay. Thank you for holding down the prep of it all. Mm. Take your time to see everybody if you haven't, if you want to. Well, Michelle is back home in Hawaii. I'm still in Albuquerque. We're headed back in a couple of days. Mm. Good to see everyone. Hope you're well. Well, today um, we're just going to start with a little bit of Brahma Vihara equanimity practice. Just a little bit. And we start conceptually where you attune the heart mind to the vast range of joy and sorrow in this world. And you can start with yourself, just like just it's, we'll just take a little time to just kind of hold and attune to the vast range, physically, mentally, emotionally, within yourself. your life. And it, it's a way to hold that range of pleasure and pain, joy, sorrow. And find the place in us, in the midst of it, the spiritual quality of understanding that things are just as they are. It's this uh, peace with how things are. holding that way that we get born here and face the range, the vicissitudes. Things are just as they are. Then you might just open that understanding, the connection with this range, just with the beings around you, human beings, birds, animals, fish, water beings, breathing beings, just around in your neighborhood. Mm. 
things are just as they are. Again, we're all born into this way of the world. This we all share. And with maybe having this beautiful jewel of an earth in our heart. and connecting with this understanding of what we all share, all of us beings on this planet. This vast range of joy and sorrow. Things are just as they are. And then noticing if you can connect with kindness for this truth that we're sharing kindness or care, tenderness. For the shared vulnerability. And from this open, vast, open awareness coming back to yourself. And seeing if you can bring the kindness, care, or tenderness for yourself for this shared vulnerability. of just connecting with this way of the world, Lokadama. We share our breath with so many breathing beings. And just shifting to the mindfulness practice of noticing the physical sensations of this movement. Just seeing if the attention can connect with just as this movement began. And with this swelling expansion, right to the end of that swell, like the tip of a wave.
and seeing if you can connect the attention right with the contraction, the falling, the disappearing. All breathing being. Share this. With us. And notice any physical sensations that call your attention naturally in our bodies. Again, these elements we share with all beings, coming and going. Maybe a little heat, pressure, tingling. Coolness, tightness, soft, hard, rough. Just these textures and vibrations coming and going by themselves. Earth, air, fire, water. Not me, not I, not mine. And the sounds. Textures, vibrations coming and going by themselves. Thoughts, noticing when your thoughts just are very light, chatter, if you look at them, they're so insubstantial. They disappear most of the times before you can see them clearly or hear them clearly. When we're really identified with them, they seem so believable and permanent. So loud. Insistent. At those times, it's helpful to connect with the other sense doors. Hearing, breath, sensations in hands or feet. And the same with emotions. Sometimes they're very light. Light sadness, light happiness. 
like compassion or joy, light irritation, fear. When they're stronger, again, when we're really identified or triggered, just remembering to reconnect with a sense store that can hold the attention enough to have some kind of safe harbor. some protection from our own lack, loss of perspective, of impermanence itself. With as much care, kindness, tenderness as you can.
Thank you, Michelle. Um, so we have a little bit of time for some questions. If anyone has any about your practice that we might be able to support you with, um, we won't go as long today. I think we're, we're both needing a little bit of recovery from our travel. <laughs> but yeah, we wanna we wanna hear how folks are and if there's anything we can do to help. So if you have a um, question about your practice, you can go to the uh, reactions button on the bottom of your screen and click it and hit uh, raise your hand and we'll know that you have a question. And if you can't find that, you can write a little note to us in the um, <laughs> chat saying you have a question and we'll call on you. Did I scare them saying that we're tired? I think so. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> we're not that tired. We're, not that we? tired. we're here. We're here. <laughs> we're standing up. <laughs> Rose. Hey Rose. Hey, Rose. Oh, let me. Um... Okay, you can unmute yourself there. Okay, thanks. I don't have something hugely prepared, but I thought I would just raise a question. Um, and I could probably do some research on this, but here we are. Um, <laughs> the fathom long body, instead of like unfathomable, we call it fathom because it's like I can understand the universe in my whole being like that's why it's called fathom instead of unfathomable can you just describe that phrase because i feel like it's used quite frequently thanks i i feel like a fathom is a measurement that i don't actually know what it is like a maritime measurement or something it's Come underwater up. underwater a fathom is a unit of length equal to six <laughs> Used principally in the measurement and specification of marine depth. <laughs> yeah, it's depth. But I, but I think that's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, I mean, I, it must be where the word to fathom that you're using it as, like, to be able to comprehend. It must come from the measurement question, you know. Um, I don't know, Michelle, do you? you, you yeah, I have, well, I have a sense of what I understand about it in relationship to fathom because um, but for a number of reasons, and I'm, I'm hoping, I, I, my tired, tiredness shows, and like I already have a number of answers and I might forget a few, but um, There, there is a way where when we talk about non-conceptual reality that um, when our attention is able to perceive reality from a place of non-conceptual reality, right? So there's the word hand, I'm showing my hand. There's a word hand, but there's a direct experience of the sensations within, within the hand that we're learning how to... Um, pay attention to that's very different than the word hand. So I see that as starting to fathom. You're starting to fathom. You're, we call it dropping deeper into the experience rather than um, just staying in one layer of reality and uh, just living in the world of uh, words like wall, foot, right? You know all that, Rose. So like the fathoming of the 
whole universe is such a beautiful uh, description of this practice because that's what we're doing. We're we're understanding, we're fathoming the the whole body as um, not not a solid visual image, right? Like we tend to think of our body as a me, my body, and it's usually the image. But when we start to fathom the direct experience, we start to understand it as we really can understand the whole universe in our body, right? We can, we can see that range of um, <laughs> galactic, uh, quantum, <laughs> You know, like black holes and, right, like incredible uh, earthquakes and temperatures and flowing and stuck. All the, the ways that water, earth, air, and fire are manifesting, we can understand that in our own body. We don't have to, um, we don't have to go anywhere. We do not have to go outside the door to understand the whole universe the fathom long universe. So that's how I understand it. Is it just like the physical body as in like foundation one? Or are we talking all six sense doors and just experience textures, like everything that's perceptible or? I think that how, he, it's two, it's two parts to that sentence. And so when he says, when the Buddha said, you can understand the whole universe, in this fathom long body, um, he's particularly referring to the body. But I think that um, if you look at our thoughts <laughs> or our emotions, often they're connected in some way to an idea of a I or a me or a mine that's at least referring back to um, our concept of who we are through the body. Or if you also perceive thinking as vibration, if you pull away. Right, right. That's how I see it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even in the, like in the Satipatthana Sutta, the, it's like there's an understanding that just through mindfulness of breathing, you actually end up fulfilling all of the foundations of mindfulness. So even though breathing is, a, you know, the, the physical element of air and, you know, watching the, that, even if you just watch the breath, that ultimately you're going to notice Vedana, you're going to notice mind, you're going to notice all of the ways in which the um, different mental factors come to play at, you know, creating the, you know, liberating insight experience. So I think that it is explicit in other parts of the teachings um, that even just through the body that you're going to experience the mind and you're going to experience the other sense doors and that that all is, yeah, you know, an explicit part of it. For sure. Though I would just be careful about mind as vibration. It's like explore, check it out. I, I think there is in this tradition a distinction. A distinction of like how interwoven mind and matter are, but that they would that they are ultimately considered like kind of of different qualities, same nature of, of arising and passing, but but of different kind of qualities. So yeah, but worth checking out, because for sure, sometimes this question of like, how deeply entwined, and how physical sometimes emotion can feel, right? And how uh, physical thought can feel, or, or where is the difference between a sound and the thought of a sound? Um, you know, it's just it's wonderful terrain to explore. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Rose. Elena? Hello. Hi. Um, I have a question about, about uh, practicing with a young baby. So um, we have a six month old baby. Um, and since, uh, since he arrived, I, I initially, um, felt a lot of desire to practice more and really put a lot of um, too much effort into it. Um, and 
it became really over. So when I would do formal, I would try to find time for formal practice. And when I did find time, um, I would feel really great and open afterward, but then I would get really attached to that. And then, and then whenever, um, eventually a big, uh, negative feeling would come up, it would feel really, really discouraging or, you know, I'd get exhausted and it would feel really discouraging. So that wasn't working. And, um, so I've kind of stopped formally practicing for now, but I, um, I'm just trying to, to sort of do the tasks in front of me, but I, I just would love to hear what you would have to say about finding ways to practice in the midst of something that's really busy, but also, you know, with a baby, there's also just a lot of, of being with and, um, just, you know, sitting, uh, ostensibly doing nothing except being with him. So, um, yeah, just curious what you would say about that. Do you, uh, do you want me to start, Jesse, or? If you have. have a, I, do, I do have a, I mean, I think the parents that are attending are, are probably at least chuckling, <laughs> chuckling to themselves because, uh, there's a big difference between <laughs> when you bring a baby into your life and when you don't have one there. They're like, <laughs> it's a whole different way of being. And I think um, luckily you've practiced enough so that you can see having this baby as your practice, right? I mean, that's the whole key is to change the attitude about what practice is. And I, I heard you distinguishing bef between formal and the practice of having a baby, but I think um, the one thing you can count on is that uh, if you can really value those times when you're just being with is really good practice. Um, you are going to be doing an extraordinary, um, it's like an extraordinary gift you can give to your child because you're there. It, and so, and it's an extraordinary gift you can give to yourself and sharing that with that beloved new being is is the is the best gift you can give that that child so i think there that's not nothing because most people don't value those times and so if you can start valuing it then usually the child will start valuing that and you will be able to continue to share those times as the baby will have choices to not be in that space so that that's one thing i would really highly highly recommend um, to focus on that as maybe th the best you can get <laughs> most of the time. And it, it's true and it's wonderful, you know, so uh, you already, you're already seeing that and um, you know that there's so many qualities that are developing in yourself at these times like the brahma viharas the metta right the c compassion the mudita the equanimity like those that if you see that you're practicing those four brahma viharas a lot and i won't i won't go into it all in depth right now but i think it's often there isn't enough emphasis on that, I think, with parenting and also the renunciation. If you're a good parent, there's a lot of practice, like a tremendous amount of renunciation. So like that's probably top and then the Brahm Viharas and then an understanding of um, letting go of control of what you want to be happening versus <laughs> what, that's probably there's so much lessons on letting go of, of control and letting go of control. It's like unbelievable. And um, if you understand it, like if you have the practice going along with you, um, then, then all that just is developing so many spiritual qualities. 
I think where you um, usually will inevitably suffer is around having a certain control over quiet time, like where your eyes are closed and you're in a, you know, like um, that is not going to be that often unless you have hired help, <laughs> a lot of hired help. <laughs> so that's all. You can have a, you know, if you have a, somebody like a babysitter, you, you know, you're usually doing 10,000 other things to like, like a shower, right? I used to just want to have a shower, you know. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing that I think when you get hit with a baby that you're not, you didn't really know you were getting into that level of not having any time for yourself. But um, if you can handle that, then uh, you're going to be great and you'll be developing really a lot of, a lot of spiritual qualities that are really important. Thank That's you. Right. I yeah. really I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. The, and yep. then there's patience, by the way. There's patience. There's so much, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> by the by the way, that little yeah, minor is. detail. Yeah. Jesse. Yeah. I. I, I mean, every, <laughs> everything Michael just said feels so appropriate, and um, it feels, you know, that list that basically you're running through besides the Brahma Viharas of the Paramis, right, of generosity and ethical conduct, and, you know, renunciation, patience, energy, wisdom, you know, all those things. It's like just to remember, to be careful of thinking that's not formal practice. You know, like, I think I noticed, you know, usually when I sit a retreat or I'm teaching a retreat, I am, I try my best to be like careful coming off of retreat, right? Of like if, if there's any way I can build in a little bit of like protective time and rest and whatever. And um, I was not able to do that, right? It's like I jumped straight into this other thing after this last retreat we finished. And, and it, it has been amazing for me to see that like, oh, okay, you, I, I have to be so much more um, like actively these things like patience, determination, there it's not passive. Th that's why I'm like, it's like to be careful about thinking of it as not a formal practice. It's like, if you understand that you are doing this, that you are practicing patience <laughs> and that you are practicing generosity and that, or that you are reflecting on the 32 parts of the body of like diarrhea and vomit, and, you know, it's like, if you recognize that as like, this is what I'm doing, you don't, there's a little bit, there's more of a chance of feeling like it's practice versus that it's just an inundation keeping you from practice. And um, because I really do get that piece around, even if you could carve out the time every day to sit for however long, there is a way, of course, that that might feel good. But, but I think what you're saying and what makes a lot of sense to me and what we talk about a lot is like, actually sitting in that way can make you feel very vulnerable to like all of the kind of mayhem of existence and then you suddenly have a mayhem of existence that requires a lot of responsibility and and attending to and so just feeling like um understanding why that that particular form of formal practice might not feel appropriate and that that feels like totally understandable and wise on your part that actually like getting super quiet and super sensitive might not be the best thing for you to be kind of have to feel like you're re-engaging with this you know beautiful being in your life and so a little bit of sense of like you actually need to protect your mind through the like activated version of these things um sometimes might give you a little bit more sense of strength in it versus just the sense of overwhelm that can I know can you know be a part of that scenario so yeah it's wonderful good luck <laughs> Kristen hello Michelle and Jesse and everyone thank you um, yeah, thank you. 
Can you talk a bit about practicing with the fires? And I know it has to do with understanding equanimity, compassion. Um, I, I just felt the need to acknowledge them and it's it's such a, you know, with the Arctic being on fire and the tropics being on fire, like the world is at a tipping point and um, how do we practice with that? Sorry, well, I know you that, No, no, it's, it's Lahaina is quite close by. Um, uh, it's why I started with equanimity to stay today. I, um, it wasn't that much in the news, but where we live, um, our neighborhood went into mandatory evacuations and our house sitter had to evacuate and leave the cats, for example. And um, I just took a little, um, I got in last night, but I, I, I went to look at the one fire <laughs> that came very close. And um, the smell, the smell was sickening. I like I can't imagine what it must be like with these bigger fires because I couldn't. I had to get out of there. I it was so horrible a smell even. But it's just um, I I know so many people right now who are their house burned down or not just here like in Washington. And it I think we're all very affected by this and I'm glad you brought up that well just Quebec right or it, anyway Arctic it's like so predominant and um, I'm not sure where to jump with this because there's so much in it Kristen and I think that One of the things that I felt was very, when I left there and came home and my, my house is filthy, like all the soot and the ashes and like the, the winds were so high, like it is unbelievable dirty, like it's, it's like shocking. And I kept feeling like I'm so lucky, but this is so hard, right? Like I was like, I'm so lucky, but this is so hard. And I think that that's generally probably like how all of us are just going to keep feeling who have at least like what we have right it's like this is this is a direction where um there's no safe there's no safety anymore and it it's um nowhere you can run to that is a a given right uh and so that but i think there's so many lessons in it and that um I think focusing on what we have, even if our house burns down, I mean, focusing on the kindness people offer or like where they're, even in my yard, because the winds were so high, I'm focusing on what lived through it. I'm really having to focus on what lived through it rather than just what didn't. And I think that um, that bottom line of how do you, how do you go through the days when it's like this f as a global community well to get through it you have to see the range of joy and sorrow and you have to be able to um, keep yourself strong with the Brahma Viharas and the practice so that you can handle whatever comes your way but also help other people it's like we are we are clearly if people don't get we're all in it together at this point you know they're they're not getting it it's like this is the the goodness of it is that is that we have to dig deep and and keep our practice strong and help each other through um this karma 
this collective karma. That's how I see it. There's this range of joy and sorrow. And you can't just focus on the sorrow. We have to f focus on the kids. We have to focus on... <sighs> the life that's left always as well as the life that's gone and that's what I recommend I don't know I'm I got very impassioned about it this morning because it's so um, present here right now so I'm not trying to minimize anything here I'm in fact, I think that we have to see how much grief not only is happening now, but um, unless th there's a great um, big shift, I think that we're ha we're ha we have to be realistic about we're fi what we're facing, right? We have to we have to get it. That's what you're saying, and I think the. <sighs> the goodness about of being alive now is how much we can help by being present and cultivating the spiritual qualities and learning and growing together i don't i don't see it that part as negative this one last thing, I think Jesse will have a lot to say, but it's clearly where it's the most sad is where there's unnecessary suffering, right? Like this is this is a level of suffering that there's so much of it that is unnecessary. There's a lot of dukkha that the Buddha talked about that is here and present. And so I think where we all get entangled is that this could have been prevented. I mean the the level of destruction and yet we keep doing the best we can to stop it but also we have to accept that um, we have to be realistic in, in how it's unfolding and again like do our best our can to step up to the plate and um, be with it the best way we can that's, that's how I would say it you yeah. <laughs> I'm focusing uh, like right now I'm focusing on the on the, like the, this vast fire that's right next to me that happened it's not is it's not nearly as big as what's happened most places that are reported on the news but it's enough to be very shocking very very shocking <laughs> so I think that um you have to go through the shock and the grief and then also focus on what's alive. And nurture that. So Jesse, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think I just would say that I... Um, you know, like, there are... There are there are always people in, who are going through famine. There's people in extreme poverty. There are people having fires in their lives. There are floods always, right? So there's something about like, this is part of human reality always. And we also are living in a time where like a lot of people have managed to like accumulate enough insulation from that level of fear, um, disaster, right? That enough privilege, enough sort of security outside of that level of vulnerability. And I think part of what we're experiencing and part of what we're seeing and part of what is inevitable at this point is like, even if somehow like all of us who care about this are able to like actually like crank the machinery of like global capitalism and like to like change you know and like suddenly co2 emissions just like come to a halt and everything's our fantasy there's no we're still gonna like there, there's the the impacts that we're all gonna feel from what's already happened is inevitable and disastrous 
And I do think that like we are, what we are experiencing and going to experience is like more and more of the democratization of that level of vulnerability, right? That people's, whatever privilege any of us may have attained and insulated ourselves from that reality over the generations is going to be less viable. It's less meaningful. And that more and more people are going to find themselves overwhelmed by the environmental realities and crises that are emerging, fires, floods, whatever they might be, or, or things other, you know, whatever the, the, the level of strain around our human systems so that other non-environmental emergencies that happen aren't going to be able to be attended to. I think that sense of if we're entering a time where we're all going to be put back in touch with like the reality of our ancestors. <laughs> you know, it's like what humans have been scrabbling to try to protect themselves from for eons. Here in the Southwest, it's like I've been traveling through, you know, just like these, these ancient places, you know, and like these, these ancient Puebloan cultures, it's like they had to, you know, huge famines, huge hundreds of years of drought and what people had to do to survive that or move and totally, you know, cultures collapsed and reformed elsewhere. It's like that vulnerability is something that I think we all still have in our DNA, <laughs> you know, that we're all rightfully afraid of, you know, but I think this question now, as Michelle is saying, is like, is our inclination going to be towards more self interest and and creating more security for ourselves um or is it going to be attending to the greater good and the greater call to like attend to the vulnerability of everyone in our world and um and knowing that many people are going to contract whether it's out of fear or greed or into violence Hoarding, whatever it might be, that, that's going to be part of what we witness, and it's going to be part of our own hearts. And so the practice of all of the things that we're teaching, I mean, the way it has any social value, because it doesn't necessarily have social value, but if it's going to have social value, it's going to be in our capacity to watch the heart contract out of fear and concern and overwhelm, but not have that be paralyzing, not that have that lead to behavior that is immoral and unethical and uh, ungenerous, right? And actually have it be something that like we can deal with the stress in our own hearts and minds and our bodies and our lives around us and still have access to goodness and care and wisdom, you know, so that we're like helping like be good stewards to the world as best we can under the conditions you know that we're encountering so yeah i i think it's really super alive for all of us yeah i i'd like to add just one thing jesse and thanks and i think it's such an important question that we can't address the vastness or the the depth of it today but um the last retreat that we just taught was up in the mountains in northern New Mexico. Um, and I feel like uh, there was a way that what Jesse and I had to hold, but all the yogis had to hold, was a very different um, relationship to the question you just asked. So, like, because usually when we go to this place in northern New Mexico, you're getting away from all the issues. <laughs> it's not that you don't deal with them inside, but it, it's not in your face. It's very remote. It's in the um, Kit Carson wilderness. And what was so different this time is that it was so dry. <laughs> I, I, when I laugh, it's because it's so bad. It's funny. It was so dry. Um, I declared my nose a federal disaster area because it was like the bloody noses and just like I need, I was just like, I couldn't believe we were down to 7% humidity. Um, it, and so, but what that meant underfoot was a crunch 
a cr like every step you took was a crunch if there was grass or plants there but if there were weren't grass or plants these big cracks huge cracks in the earth were happening and it was just every day that it was like you could see like almost like a canyon starting to form and again I'm giggling because it was so intense and if you're a yogi there f for two weeks um, your question was in their face every moment like it was so painful it was so painful and I think that that's that's a very different kind of retreat to what people who've come to that retreat before felt like, right? You had some sense of here's this sanctuary, here's this protected area that you always feel would be like protected. And that's what's changed. That's what Jesse's saying. There's no um, wealth that can protect you from this. And that I think that there's a good thing in that, in that... Um, I think it's a good thing that there's a democratization of <sighs> safety. Even though it's so painful for, for all of us, but I think um, <sighs> there's some purification that the human beings are having to go through it's very clear, right? And so it's like when we go through our own purifications individually and in the path of purification spiritually, uh, we know it's important. We know it's important to face what we're facing and go through it and to um, grow from it. And I think that that's what I felt in this retreat, that it was taking maybe... <laughs> I don't want to exaggerate, but it, I think it took at least three times or four times the amount of energy to hold it, hold the retreat because of, of what's going on and the amount of reassurance, the amount of reassurance we all need that we can do this, that we can, we can hold this. We, ha we have to hold this for everybody. <laughs> That's how I see it. Thank you. Yeah. Hiroko? Or, yeah. Oh, hold on. Uh, let's see. Can you unmute there? Let's see. Hi, I've never seen it. Is that a screensaver or real people? I love yeah, this. That's a, it's a background, you know. Oh. Harry does that. Oh, <laughs> so cool. There we go. Um, so I'm Hiroko's husband. Hi, Hiroko's husband. Hi, Aruko. She invited me, and we just had a fantastic experience. I think. Thank you for for giving us that that gift. It was very beautiful. Um, so this is kind of more of a general question. And before I get into that, um, our hearts go out to people in Maui, and we live on the Big Island of Maui, um, very close to home. And, and in a way, it kind of reminds us that we're grateful for just a regular day, you know, because sometimes people just right now are suffering and they're not having a regular day. Um, and just the peace and tranquility that we have is really a gift because at any moment that can be taken away. Uh, hopefully we would still have peace and tranquility, even though that's taken away. Anyways, um, so I like to just kind of talk about the dichotomy um, how you guys see it and how um, you guys are able to come to terms with, you know, the material world, which we live in, um, and the spiritual world. So how to balance those out, like accessing the spiritual world through meditation or channeling or, or you know, um, focusing on, on things that cannot be weighed or measured, you know, like... Um, empathy, love, charity, those types of things. Um, but how do we also live in this world that um, is, you know, basically um, very materialistic, very consumption driven, very, um, it, it calls our attention. And even now with the phones and all of that, 
where we're pulled in that direction of like, we have to live in this world, but I don't believe that the solution is in this world. I, I believe that, you know, the solution is walking more of a spiritual walk and unplugging from this world and stepping into that other world that so many, so many masters have said, you know, that there is another world. We just, and we have access to it, you know, um, how do we balance those things out? Furthermore, um, regarding some of the things that happen in this world, how, how do we accept the way that things are unfolding and yet and have goals and objectives to what we want, to be driven, to go to college or, you know, to finish a degree, to get a job, to move forward, to raise a family. Those are all goals. And um, how do we say, well, I'm going to let it unfold the way that it needs to unfold. Um, yet we're so like, this, this is what I want. I want to be able to, you know, have a good job or I want to be able to, you know, live in a nice place, provide for my family. Um, it's hard to tell your family, we're going to focus on the spiritual realm <laughs> when, when there really is no material. I mean, there's got to be a certain amount of, um, safety and security that that we all need yeah but when is it too much where do we draw that line how do we discern that or oh, now we're getting into you have everything that you need how you're getting into now um greed or you're getting into um hoarding or you're getting into eating too much and and how do we how do we step back and 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 realize that we do things we do some things especially me like i think that I want certain things and I get hooked on the online shopping, right? And I think it's gonna make me happy. And then when I get it, I'm just like, yeah. Um, so how, how do we teeter totter between this world and that world and know when this world is too much and take a step back and retreat to, you know, meditative and then try to, and try to grow in that world, try to mature in that world. Um, that's pretty much it. That's it, huh? That's the only <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's like, that's every person on this thing, right? We're all like, oh, God, I know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, I mean, we'll see what Michelle has to say, too. It's like, this is it. That's the question. You know, it's like, you can't, you have to have you have to be in both. We cannot deny the material world and the realities, the social realities we're in and the needs we have. And, uh, you know, I was I was thinking in my head of these people, it's like, oh, let them eat love, you know? It's like, cannot, you know, that's not, you have to eat food. <laughs> and like, what's the, um, all of the balance that we are trying to do, all of us in our own ways, you know? And I think that's partly what's so, you're pointing at so hard is like, it's not just one way. It'd be easy if it could just say, oh, well, it's just this. You just do this, you do this, you do this, you know? But it's like, it's always, you could just follow rules, right? And that would be like kind of discipline that like gets you somewhere, but it doesn't feel as authentic, right? And so that it's like, you get, just like you're saying with the online shopping or just our whatever our behaviors are, where you see there's something in it, which is like, it's not necessarily like really bad, but you can start to see that there's something compulsive, there's something kind of greedy in it, but also there's something good. You wanna get something for yourself. You wanna take care of yourself or you, you actually need something. Um, where is that line? I mean, I do think it's what I value so much about this Buddhist path is like, it's not just about you know denying the world and denying the reality of our livelihoods and a need to make a livelihood, you know? We are in a lineage that for many centuries was mostly monks and nuns, right? And so that they did just, they, they had their community. They still have a lot of things to deal with in that reality, but they don't have jobs. They don't have families. You know, they're taking care of their own community, living just on donations and trying to live very simply, you know? And so there's something that like we really honor with that and is very beautiful in that. But the Buddha also taught for lay people like us, you know, and but he said that it's hard. <laughs> it's this thing. It's like it's super hard and having to negotiate things with family, having to negotiate jobs, having to 
drive around you know there's like all these monks and nuns are not supposed to drive and part of it's like you're just killing things all over you know and it's like how do you balance that you know so i mean i do think it's you know this the you know the eightfold path that the buddha talked about of right view right intention right speech right action right livelihood right effort right mindfulness right concentration so there's only those two, you know, some of it's about meditation, but a lot of it is about these things of like, how are we trying to live into these expectations and how do we try to make good decisions and understand that when we make bad decisions that we are the owners of our actions, you know, that we're responsible for that. And that there's also things that are out of our control and we try our best, you know, to be motivated by love and motivated by wisdom and motivated by caring, compassion equanimity, but also get that we're imperfect, you know, and, and then when we make decisions that hurt people or hurt ourselves, you know, you try to repair it as soon as possible. Um, but I just feel like those are all issues we're all struggling with, you know, and um, it's, it's like refreshing to hear it again, <laughs> you know, because I don't think any of us have the answer. And that's actually a big part of I feel like what all of us are trying to figure out. It's like, but protecting time for the spiritual, like you get it, it's important, you know? So it's like, if it's once a week, if it's every day, if you can go on something that's like a longer program, you know, a longer retreat, it's like, yeah, you, some of these things are easier to develop with a little bit of protection, you know, a little bit of like, like this, you know, quietude, a little bit of just like putting down everything and being able to just watch the mind and watch the body and, and just deal with it because when we're so engaged in the world around us it's just so hard to also be focusing on what's happening internally and that's part of that dynamic that's why we try to sit and meditate is so that we have some you close our eyes it's like we have some protection for a little while to try to watch all this craziness right and try to come to terms with it and try to work with it in a way that's peaceful and kind internally you know and then when we open our eyes and we go out into the world, it's like, how are we trying to bring that into the world? But it's hard. It's hard to be dealing with everything externally and still paying attention to what's happening internally. So that juggling that you're talking about, that that seesaw, you know, is that's that's the thing. And we just keep trying to, you know, for I'll just say, I don't know what Michelle has to say, but it's like we just keep trying our best, you know, and being honest about where it's not working and where we need maybe a little more discipline here, a little more, you know, protection over here, a little more forgiveness for ourselves over here, you know, whatever that might look like. I don't know, Michelle, what do you think? Oh, you're muted still, hold on. Can you... I think there's so many layers to your question and I think Jesse's addressed a lot of them, so I'm just going to tell a story <laughs> about what just happened uh, with someone recently. And um, because sometimes I think some of these questions come down to trust, like a, a kind of a trust in how you're navigating. It, it, because everything Jesse says leads to that. It's like you, you go a little bit this way, you get the feedback that might not be so good, so you trust that you're going to be able to navigate a little bit this way. It's, it's so much of it um, will come down to reorienting to a kind of deeper, wordless uh, trust. And uh, I have a friend that's almost all spirit almost all spirit and it, being in the physical trying to make ends meet is r really hard and now she's 72 and she wants to retire um, she hasn't had a paycheck since December because of uh, an illness and she's so on the edge but it's like she's always been almost on that edge and now she's over it and um, because I kinda came home more slowly than I usually do because of some pain in my body I um, I stopped stopped in San Francisco outside the airport hotel and uh, I asked her if she was wanting to come down. She had to drive really far from Northern California to see me and she said she would and I, 
I knew, I sort of figured out it would be hard for her physically, um, but I didn't realize it was going to be hard for her financially to even just make the trip. And so it's a longer story than that, but she came down, um, and there was a parking garage. The only option for parking was a parking garage. She had, was going to borrow, I knew that the story was she was going to borrow a friend's car and need an electric plug. So I had looked into where she would need the electric plug. Isn't this interesting? So I had all that set up. But she didn't take that car. <laughs> she took one. Anyway, um, I didn't know she didn't have enough money to pay for the parking. And we, she came in to see me, and we had this incredible conversation about kind of what you're asking, like, and how, and she's trying to find a place of like, w what direction to go in now. And we talked about all different options, and then um, I told her I would pay for the garage. So I, it didn't, you know. She's like, but, but there's a different, deeper place here, Michelle. Like it's like I had to trust that I would something would work out so I could come down to see you. So the, <laughs> I'm, I'm skipping a few parts. Okay, so we go out into the garage um, when she's going to leave, and I was going to drive with her a little bit up the road. So we got in the garage, and we're coming out, and there was this very long line of vehicles. <laughs> And as we get closer to it, there's a guy standing there, and he's waving. He, they're not, they're not charging anybody for the like fee. Like, the, he's waving them. We're, the, we get through, and she looked at me, and she said, "Well, this is what I'm talking about." <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. Isn't that interesting? Yes, and yes. it was just like, and I just like, I laughed so hard. Oh my God, it was so funny. But it was just like a reflection on yeah. that sort of how she stayed afloat and it was so beautiful you know do you but it's like she she's gonna have a hard time right now I'm trying to help help her f think out a reverse mortgage if it's time for that blah 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 but anyway I just wanted to offer that as something that is inexplicable in some way but I know we all have to navigate our own particular version of that does that make sense thank you for the story yeah. <laughs> that was beautiful. That was perfect. Yes. Wow. Uh, trust. Yeah, trust. It ain't easy. <laughs> and Hiroko's husband, what's your name? Oh, my name is Daniel. Okay. Hi, right Daniel. On. Nice to meet you. And it's good to see you, Hiroko. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Take good care of yourselves, of each other. And see you next week. Aloha.